Hey guys, before we start the show, I just want to give a quick shout out to another podcast. Hey there, my name is Andy, host of the History of Africa podcast. If you like learning about the history of the Asia Pacific, I bet you'd also like learning about the history of the African continent. Our current season is focused on ancient Egypt. If that sounds appealing to you, come check out the History of Africa podcast here on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. Back to you, Craig. Why, hello there. Welcome to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the complete history of the Asia-Pacific War, 1937 to 1945, and all the major events that led up to it. And because the only video thus far on my channel that has more than 300,000 views is on Midway, I have brought my friend Eric. Hello again. Over to talk about what I guess I'm going to call this episode, awesome and lesser known facts about the Battle of Midway. And we've made a list of... Quite a few facts that a lot of people do happen to know, and even if you saw the latest Midway movie, it did quite a good job covering a lot of the information about Midway. But I gather from what I have put together, we're going to have a lot more to expand upon those facts, and we are going to have some that a lot of people wouldn't know about. I can think one uh, right now that has to do with submarines. So, we're going to dive into it with the first awesome and probably the most well-known fact at this point because of the movie and that is the fact that United States codebreakers broke the JN25 code which honestly let's go ahead and say it was probably the most important thing mm -hmm. about the Battle of Midway. Indeed it was. Without breaking that code the US would have never known that this attack was coming and it was a deciding factor in this and while we don't do hypothetical history if they didn't crack that code, the outcome could have been far different. Yamamoto's, uh, <laughs> on top of the Yamato ship, and other battleships probably would have been uh, playing a part in the battle, which they didn't because they didn't get there. And the Americans would have been uh, wow, outgunned even more than they already were, and I doubt they would have been able to pull off what they did. Uh, but going into uh, the depth of this, as people probably already know, Commander Joseph Rochefort and his team at Station Hypo had partially broken the JN-25 code uh, just before Midway. They heard of a target that they deemed to be called AF, which the Japanese were looking at this whole time, but they couldn't figure out where the Japanese were targeting. They just knew what they were using and that they were coming on the date of... It was, what, between June the 4th and June the 5th. Now, what is so cool about this is Rochefort himself figured out a clever little trick on how to figure out where AF was going to be. What he did is he sent an uncoded message to Midway stating that, go say openly, uh, broadcast a message from Midway saying that the water uh, purification facility had broken down. Midway went ahead and did that, and thus... A few, I guess, it was the same day, I think it was in 24 hours, mm -hmm. the Japanese sent out a message that AF was uh, in need of water, yeah. thus figuring out that Midway was going to be the target, which was, a, you know, it was a nifty little yeah. uh, I think way it is to do that. Because especially, I think most people think of code breaking as, like, you intercept entire messages and that it's given this detailed, like they're attacking at this time with this amount of planes and ships and all that. But the reality of Code Break throughout World War II is you are picking up on certain phrases and trying to kind of, which the movie actually did a very well, a good way of explaining how yeah. like you get bits and pieces of it and you kind of have to put it together yourself to come up with a bigger picture. And that's what happened at Midway. It's a perfect example of they did the water treatment plants. They were a malfunction, and even though we know they were not, yeah. they were able to make a big picture that, oh, Midway's going to be the big hit, and we know they're going to be sending everything they have against it. Yeah, they had the entire battle order. 
So uh, the commanders, they knew all the ships that were going to be there and pr a good proximity of the date in which they would yeah. show up. Um, and that brings us to um, our second point. Uh, something that I don't think was brought up in the mm -hmm. movie. And I, I'm sorry we keep talking about the movie, but it came out recently yeah. and a lot of people <laughs> are interested in maybe because of it. Uh, that's the key feature of radar. As uh, we know, the United States Navy was piloting its radar in 1938. Uh, even at Pearl Harbor, they were using a form of radar, mm -hmm. although the guy who <laughs> was working it, uh, no one was listening to him when he yeah. said that a big flock of what was deemed to be birds, birds I believe yeah, they the, said. <laughs> yeah, coming over all the mountains and all that, and he's there screaming and yelling, and they're just like, your equipment is malfunctioned because radar was so new and so effective, they couldn't believe that it yeah. was that effective they thought that it had to be mistake in the system because no system could catch that many planes coming from that far away mm -hmm. it was it was a shock of how well it was working to them at pearl harbor so all three of the united states carriers had radar and some of the supporting vessels mm -hmm. also did so uh in so facto if the japanese were going to send a uh, barrage of planes their way the americans would have an early warning system mm -hmm. whereas the japanese would have little to no warning because it would be by you know the view of their destroyers whoever was on the outskirts of the formation this led and i have a nice little quote here one scholar named mark pd who was a specialist in the japanese military who said of Nagumo's Kido Batai force that they had a glass jaw because the Japanese could throw a punch but couldn't take one, which proved to be very true. <laughs> yeah. As we will see as the podcast continues. <laughs> oh, yes. On our third outstanding fact, which I really liked, and I will give credit where it's due, I heard about this through Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, which I am quite a fan of. Shout out to him, too. He He's keeps my the, passion alive for history. The grandfather of history podcasts. Yeah. Shout out to Dan Carlin if he, for some reason, he manages to watch this. Shout out to oh, him. I would fucking have, I would have a heart attack. I know the same. And he would tell me like how bad my narration. Is <laughs> and, yep. Oh yeah. Uh, the third fact is the USS Yorktown was put out to sea after 48 hours of being repaired in dry docks at Pearl Harbor. And if you had seen my episode on Midway, I'll say it right now to my critics. I had said at one point that from the Battle of the Coral Sea and going all the way back to Pearl Harbor, that it was about two weeks in which the Yorktown was estimated to be repaired. I did not say it was repaired in two weeks, but a lot of people accused me of saying this. And this is slanderous, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it was repaired in 48 hours, although that was while it was in the dry yes. dock at Pearl Harbor. What expands upon this fascinating fact, and I can actually, I think you believe in this one. Yes, um, this is, not many people know about this. Well, the people who were fixing the ship were more or less um, civilians from Hawaii. Engineers, ar architects, um, just the general uh, maintenance service. I know, I, I don't know why I said architects. <laughs> I'm sorry, I... Servicemen, we'll call them servicemen. Yeah. Hawaiian servicemen. <laughs> The Hawaiian servicemen, who were all civilians, stayed on the ship as it was sailing to Midway. Midway. So it was constantly being repaired. And this is why the Yorktown was able to actually fight. was because civilians stayed on the ship knowing that they are going to a battle and could lose their life. A, a decided, battle. The yes, decisive battle. <laughs> exactly. And they knew how important the Yorktown was. That... Every single carrier was so important. Just having one more carrier could have been the deciding factor and it was. for the battle. Because, that... no, well, I mean, uh, they didn't think there would be any carriers actually at the battle um, mm -hmm. about to attack them. But the Japanese really did believe that the Yorktown had been knocked out at Coral Sea. And they thought exactly. they would be facing only two carriers. And the Yorktown surprised the hell of the Kido yeah. Tai. And having another Essex-class aircraft carrier at your disposal, it's quite devastating especially for the offense not so much defense but the offense it was tremendously an asset for the u.s and our fourth one which was shown in the movie <laughs> midway which i was surprised because it's a bizarre uh fact yeah <laughs> is a celebrated hollywood director filmed the battle john ford uh, who directed The Grapes of Wrath, and he did a lot of work with uh, John Wayne now uh, for most of his life. Um, but it was at Admiral Nimitz's request that he be stationed on Midway uh, during the battle. And uh, it was during the battle he was actually filming, and he suffered a bomb concussion and a gunshot wound, I believe, in his leg. 
And what's really funny is I found out, and I mean, this is the legend information, that apparently while he was receiving first aid, he would not stop filming. <laughs> so he got that documentary done. He ended up winning, uh, was it a Oscar for best documentary of the year? But what I found curious, and I did not know this myself, was he was part of the OSS, uh, I guess he was a photography unit, and he went on to work for, uh, the OSS by the way is a precursor to the CIA, he worked throughout World War II for them and during the Korean War. So, uh, you know, kudos to him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I believe our fifth, and I came across this information completely spontaneously. I had no idea about this, and I find this is one of the most shocking uh, parts of Midway. And that was during the Aleutian Island campaign. Um, so as many people already know, uh, during the Battle of Midway, a force was sent up to uh, invade the Aleutian mm -hmm. Islands. Um, it's not confirmed, but it does seem like the Japanese were just doing a faint attack to try and get a bunch of Americans to bring vessels up to uh, basically split them up from what would be the Battle of Midway in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And it was just, you know, divide and conquer uh, yep. tactic. Of course, the Codebreakers were aware of this and they believed it to be a feint also. And uh, they put up, uh, I'm not going to say a minimal effort to defend the island chain, but um, they knew it was not going to be a very winnable battle and yeah. they weren't going to put any... It, uh, was, it, it was a token resistance. Yeah. I mean, to, it's, it's mean yeah. to say because, of course, a lot of people lost their lives fighting yes. for it. And there were forces in, uh, in Alaska and the other islands that did fight violent, valiantly. Um, but uh, what I'm about to bring up, I had no idea. So, um, with all things stated, of course, the Japanese did invade the islands, um, specifically, let me get the names of Kiska and Atu, but there was indigenous people that lived on these islands. Um, I hope I am using the proper name for them, Aleuts. Uh, their chief, who was named, uh, where do I have his name? You see it? Yeah. Their chief. Oh. Unangax. He uh, was told by the United States forces before the Battle of Midway and the invasion to evacuate, but he had declined. So when the Japanese took the islands, um, the Japanese took these aboriginal people and uh, eventually they ended up in internment camps, internment camps in Hokkaido, uh, northern Japan, uh, which is a horrible uh, situation, although I think they were actually treated better than uh, white people, mind you. But anyways, What's interesting about all this is after the Americans had retaken what was uh, invaded by the Japanese and during the Battle of Midway from the other islands, the Americans ended up taking um, the Aboriginal Aleutan people and putting them in internment camps in Alaska against <laughs> their will. Over 881 of them were forcefully put in these camps in Alaska in unsanitary conditions. So you can then say that this poor group of people who were just minding their own business, living their lives, were taken by two nations because they were fighting a war and interned by both. That's it's pretty horrible. Yep. <laughs> I had no idea to this day uh, that such a thing had occurred, and it is a sad and tragic fact. And hopefully, knowing this, more people try and understand more about the situation itself and the effects of it on those island chains because it's definitely not something that's well covered like even us we only did a brief very uh, brief yes. very brief but i am sure if we actually dealt a lot I mean, we, we could find a lot of information about this struggle a uh, very little known fact when they were retaking the islands the Lucian, uh, island campaign it was canadian and american forces that landed on those islands to take them and the japanese had already left the Americans and Canadians did not know this, and there was a great fog for many days, and they ended up accidentally shooting each other many times, and I guess you could argue it was one of the biggest blunders. <laughs> That's <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it was, it was a humorous episode I saw on YouTube by a fellow his, a historian, so kudos to him on that. It was an interesting episode. Uh, and to match this, uh, our next fact is during the Aleutian Island campaigns, on Akuten Island, uh, the first Zero fighter intact was captured because a poor <laughs> pilot had to crash land and he ended up uh, walking, I guess, for miles in the snow. They found his body eventually. I think his name was Kido something. Uh, long story short, it was acquiring the Zero fighter in which the American scientists were able to reverse engineer it and then make further designs on some of their uh, future aircraft, such as uh, what would be the Hellcat. I guess the, what would you say, the the next evolution of the wildcat. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. 
Oh, yeah, the doorbell rang. That's uh, obviously, I think I ordered something from Amazon. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we can edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed, like, I'm we're so, almost looked at no, each other. I know, I was like, wait, are, awkward. We, <laughs> are, are, are we stopping to get that? <laughs> okay. Uh, but just to uh, go further into it, um, it's been argued by a lot of military historians that it wasn't necessarily a re the reverse engineering of the Zero Fighter that led to such great improvements for the future aircrafts. It was more or less the test driving of the Zero Fighter in which pilots realized the limitations and how Japanese pilots were using these things and they were able to get tactics to use against the Japanese because apparently that, that worked outstandingly, uh, 4344. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and they crashed the Zero Fighter. Accidentally during a test run, hmm. but it is in a museum. I forget where in the United States uh, I'll let you pick uh, one up. All right, so One thing I always found it should be fascinating especially if you watch movies or that When you watch these big naval battles, especially with carrier naval battles You see the armaments they're using especially the anti-aircraft armaments and when you're seeing these planes fight through all you're seeing is just tracer rounds and black smoke everywhere like it looks like a hornet's nest a hornet's nest it's terrifying yeah exactly like try imagining being like in a devastator t torpedo bomber like flying sea level trying to just staying straight and all you're having is all these bullets and shells and all that firing at you but you rarely see ever planes shot down during this and it, it always made me wonder like how effective really was the munitions and the actual armaments of ships other than planes or carriers because it seems like the um the japanese were putting all their effort into building big ships like the whole um big gun theories and all that yep. stuff like big gun platforms where you get these big capital ships that have big like 16 inch 15 inch cannons Case or some point yamato yeah uh, 17 inch caliber cannons and then you have an abundance of naval guns of like five inch, uh, I think it was five or six inch naval caliber um, artillery shells. Then you have numerous AA mounts. If you're um, the Japanese, you had your triple A mounts, which were, I want to get the um, <laughs> uh, proper calibers of them correct. But I know for the Americans, they used a lot of 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter armaments that were considered very effective. Well, during the battle, they were not that effective, I would have to say, because going off of one statistic, just the uh, Japanese side, they managed to kill, or not kill, shoot down 150 American planes. Well, of those 150 American planes, it's reported that only five of them were actually shot down by anti-aircraft ships. Which begs the question, like, that seems quite a few. Like, why even bother having AA guns at that point? Because you're almost shooting down nothing. Well, the Japanese were still... The Americans were starting to evolve their carrier-based philosophies on how to defend it. And it was revolving more around CAPS, which is uh, combat air patrols that were just like um, the wildcat fighters circling around carriers and all that to protect them and not their AA. Where the Japanese still had this idea that these big, big ships with all these armaments were just going to shoot down any plane coming at them. Which, the Yamato did take down a ton of yes. aircraft when it went through that suicide <laughs> run at the end and was its only real run, I guess. But yeah, anyways. No, going. no, yeah, it, it was, that is very true. But we also know, well, going to the future, that AA technology vastly differed year by year because the AA technology in 1941 was still World War I caliper um, ammunition guns like on the um, carrier Kaga, which was rated as one of... Um, the, the Japanese's best carriers. And if you actually look at the... Uh, here. If you actually look at the Japanese armor, uh, the Kaga armaments, which they loaded up with anti-aircraft because they thought this thing was going to be impregnable because the Kaga was started off as a battleship. Yeah, yeah it was an interesting... It, the, uh, it was the warships I learned. Yeah, that of all I, I learned that too. Um, the ship was built... As a battleship, and then halfway through, they realized, well, we can just slap a deck on this and make it into a carrier because 
The Japanese saw the offensive capabilities of carriers, but still didn't really realize the defensive capabilities of carriers. Everybody was like this, though. Um, yes. We'll talk about it later, but the Japanese are not the only ones guilty of being yes. stuck in the old big gun uh, side of it. There was basically two arguments. One side was battleships are the most important ships in naval warfare. We have the big guns, the big armor. And then a new emerging side at this point was, oh no, carriers are going to be the future naval warfare. And they were still arguing up until Midway. Uh, yeah, I would say Midway was the big one that stopped it. Uh, and everyone realized aircraft carriers were the future. Now, so just to go on, I, I just want to give you an example of the philosophy of the Japanese um, thinking because they were still thinking even in AA they were thinking big guns will save the day if we can put a big gun on the Kaga and have it point up into the air we're just gonna shoot a shell at it and it's just gonna keep hitting these planes one after the other this was proven at Midway to be highly inaccurate <laughs> just to going off of their um, they had on each side of the middle of their deck, a one twin gun Model B turret, and then on the aft they had six of these. So these, if you don't really know, are like those big long naval guns you see. Not like the 16 caliber ones, but more like they're 5 inch calibers. Yeah. But you see them, they're the kind of like long barrels and all that. Well, the Japanese thought that these were going to be their saving grace, even though they were from the 30s and were completely outdated by this time. Because they were originally put on the ship to attack other ships because their philosophy was yeah. that well their battleships and their cruisers and all that are going to be trying to attack this carrier yeah because the idea was that these yeah. ships were going to be facing each other they didn't think they'd be facing a, a wave of a thousand aircraft yeah. coming at them yeah. so yeah so they had all these naval guns along the akaga that was like oh we're just going to light up all these ships that come near us and then our aircraft are going to go and finish them off kind of thing and when they realized this wasn't going to happen they turned them into aa guns well, the problem with these AA guns that they really were emphasizing for their defense strategy was they could only reach a 55 degree angle realistically. They were advertised Jeez. as at reaching a night. They thought realistic that this gun could go 90 degrees up and shoot because that's what they said in the manuals. Well, if you actually look at actual soldiers and all that reports, these guns could only really realistically fire at a 55 degree angle. Yeah, I was, I'm trying to think of myself how that would look. That would make no sense. Yeah, because, well, and not just that, to reload this gun, you have to bring it back down to a <laughs> 5 degree angle, oh, boy. reload it, oh, and then yeah, put it yeah. back up and shoot. This made it just completely incapable of being a real anti-aircraft gun. And not to mention... The whole philosophy of both sides, I will say, was a curtain of steel, essentially. Essentially, we are going to fill the entire sky with just rounds of stuff. Like, the point of AA was never to directly hit a uh, plane. shrapnel, you're hoping to get hit something. And you're hoping yeah. to hit something. It's like a shotgun in the air. Well, the problem with this is, well, how do you do this? Well, you fire at what you think are the elevations that are usually going to be flied by these planes and all that stuff. Well... Pilots aren't idiots. They kind of know that they think, oh, we're, we're going to fly at this elevation. So they're going to constantly be kind of to maneuver out of this elevation, making actually accurately firing these guns nearly impossible because you have to set fuses and all that. And the fuses go off completely randomly, not where these ships are, or, I mean planes are. So they're just flying through, and that's why these planes... Were able to get through these smoke screens so much. But the Japanese were not. I mean, they weren't stupid. They knew that this was ineffective. Yes. They, they knew that their zero fighters were the only things that were going to protect yes. them from other aircraft. They, they they weren't relying on this. This was yes. The, this was like oh, a hail mary. If anything, <laughs> yes. at the end, <laughs> it was. I, I I can't. Well, I mean, I know I'm going really into detail on this. I can't stress enough that they knew their cap was essential, which is. They're combat air patrols. Well, the problem with combat air patrols really can only circle for around an hour before they have to come down. And funny enough, the Kaga, when the Kaga was sunk, it was sunk in between when the caps were changing and that. Well, we're going to we're going to But we're going to get to that in the future. It's actually coming up right now. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's a big yeah. one. Yeah. But yeah, so that's what I wanted to really talk about just how like just Unaffected, especially with the Kaga's like main, like middle range calipers, which would only fire three to six rounds a minute too, were useless. 
Now, I want to briefly go over the U.S., because the U.S. was slightly different than, than the Japanese, though. They were more effective, but that's a relative term, because they still were not great, but they were more effective than Japanese. The main difference, though, was in the philosophy of how to avoid getting hit by planes. The U.S., you would have your task force, and they moved as one. Even in 1942, this is well before they created, like, different screens and all that stuff. Right now, they were still, they bunched all their ships into one task force, but around the carrier. And when the carrier moved to avoid torpedoes or dive bombs, every ship took the same bearing as them to continuously keep that AA in a te technically a bubble for the carrier, which was the Japanese did not, the Japanese still had this big gun theory where their battleships, their heavy cruisers are going to be the main targets of planes because they thought that these were going to be the deciding factors. So their idea was to every ship, when it sees plane attack planes coming, disperse, literally take independent maneuvers to avoid munitions being fired at them. Well, what did this do? It opened up the carriers for these planes. And when I mean opened up, this wasn't easy by any means. These planes still... Like, 150 planes were shot down by the Japanese. It, like, it was still a terrifying experience to have to go through this. Not to mention the torpedoes didn't work. The American, yes, the American torpedoes were notoriously bad at Midway. It was, it was the dive bombers that were the, the stars. And they had no idea. Well, actually, I think they knew at this point that the torpedoes were kind of duddy. Yes. Now, but what the Americans, and we were talking about this radar before... And this is really important because the, the, the U.S. had two key assets that the Japanese did not have. And these were the Mark 37 gun fire control system that was on all the carriers. On not, I don't know if it was all the battleships, but I know a lot of the fleets were being updated with these gun fire control systems at this time. Now, what this was labeled as, this was the ears of every ship. And essentially, what it gave you, it gave the bearing of these Japanese planes, the elevation of these planes, and the range of where they're coming from. This was crucial, not just for like the AA batteries, which I'll say momentarily how like it really helped them out a lot, but for the cap, because these ships could then radio their fighter squads saying, Japanese fighters coming in from this bearing at this elevation go get them essentially yeah. the japanese didn't have the japanese had their eyes literally they had someone on high high up on their um, decks and all that with binoculars looking around Old and craziness. when they saw them they would point out and then you would have to radio your cap to go get them and all like it was it, it was like playing broken telephone and almost. during midway it was strict radio silence for the japanese yes. which completely mm -hmm. screwed them over yeah and what i will say one aa gun that the Americans had, like, that was moderately successful in comparison to a cap patrol, was there, it was, had just been made, I, I want to get the termination right for this, would be the dual purpose, um, the um, intermediate caliber dual purpose naval guns that were being produced in the late 30s for the Americans. Now, what were these guns were, they were purposely made, once again, they, they, they weren't naval guns, but purposely built AA naval guns. And the, mun the munitions they used, at this point, were standard rounds. In the future, they would become the more advanced, deadlier radar rounds. But right now, with the fire control system, they could put five inch rounds up in the sky at a very accurate rate. And they helped, but even with this, the Americans still estimated a ship would have to fire close to a thousand rounds of ammunition to bring down one plane. So imagine that. This, um, the um, naval guns that they were using for the Americans could fire 12 to 15 rounds a minute. So just doing simple math, you need to put a thousand rounds into the sky to take down one plane. And how many planes were in a squad? Like, you can see the math of how just shipborne AA while, like you said, it was a hail mary, like, they did get kills and all that, it was almost, it was rather useless to, to have them on the ship, when you, when you think about it, 
because they were just so highly ineffective for what they were meant to do, especially since the Japanese put a lot of faith that if you put more and more guns on their ships, and they did this, even at Midway, they would put low, lower caliber um, guns on their ships, which included like 20 millimeter rounds and all that stuff, uh, 20 millimeter um, a AA guns on it, they would stack them and stack them on it. But they were all so ineffective that it was just like, it was adding weight to a ship for no reason. Like, by the time the Japanese actually managed to get their guns trained on these planes, these planes were not in the same spot that they were when they were training on them. That's why the cap was so important. Like, most planes, especially the torpedo bombers, the um, Dauntlesses, they were shredded by the cap. Like, the caps would see them coming flying in low and they would just come and strafe them down. Whereas the the dive bombers being so much higher up and all that stuff, it sometimes was harder for them to get caught. And that's how they were able to, at times, get around this whole AA shield of the Japanese. And as we'll talk in after this, put a lot of hurt down on the Japanese carriers. Well, when you're relying on your Zero fighters to be basically 95% of your mm -hmm. defense. This is where we come up to, I, I lost count, I think it's number six. It's over six to number seven at this point. Uh, and it was an episode I made actually not too long ago on uh, what is called Nagumo's Dilemma. So, if you did not see the episode, I can briefly explain it. Uh, Nag Chichi Nagumo was the admiral who was, vice admiral, excuse me, at the time, who was leading the Kido Butai, so the frontal assault of the battle for Midway. <laughs> And he had brought up an issue during simulations on the battle. And that was, what happens if, while my planes go over to attack Midway, I am attacked by carriers who are sending their planes after me? Of course, him and his uh, senior officers, while making this plea, were met with, well, we can't have this battle that occurs because that's not part of the battle. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is we're going to surprise attack them and this can't occur. It won't occur. Of course, it did occur. Uh, and... It was, uh, what would you say? It was, it was foreshadowing because that's what brought down the Kido Butai. I mean, it, it was like it was set up for a movie almost. Like uh, the movie, the movie, uh, they put it, they put it in there slightly, and I, I, they did an okay job. They could have like really expanded a little more on yeah, it. Yeah, because everyone hates Nagumo. If if you're a historian of this battle, everyone hates Nagumo. Nagumo's dilemma is a well spoken about thing. Even though to this day, let's go say it didn't make any difference. But to explain what occurred. So Nagumo sent uh, his air force after Midway and they started bombing the hell out of it. First thing they noticed is there's no planes on the island in their hangars. And that must have been like, oh, maybe they know we're, we're <laughs> here. And then Nagumo has a scout who goes out and the scout finds a fleet. And Nagumo asks him, oh my god, there's a fleet out there. There shouldn't be. Uh, do they have a carrier? And the scout wasn't able to uh, confirm this. I think about four or five times. And we're talking minutes go by, people are sweating bullets, and Nagumo has a decision to make. He doesn't know if there is a carrier over there, even though he suspects this, and this is true. He wrote in his notes, he thought, and he was right, there was a carrier there. He had two choices to make. He had planes coming back. Now, that Japanese doctrine was you don't put out piecemeals, which would be uh, just, you know, I'm throwing planes left, right, center in small packs. No, you get all your planes together and they go into proper formation. And this takes a lot of time, even though the Japanese were the best and fastest at doing this. So his planes have to come and land on the carriers or else they would run out of fuel and sink. And you can't just uh, shoot out planes off your carriers and land at the same time. So he has two choices. He can let his, pl his planes come and land, outfit them to fight carriers, because remember, they're being outfitted to you know, hit an island with these big bombs. These are not meant to hit carriers. Or he could just simply send out the planes he has right now in a you know attempt to try and strike at the carrier that he thinks is out there. But let us remember, he doesn't have confirmation that it's a carrier he gets confirmation during this ordeal in a matter of minutes and yes there is a carrier out there and Nagumo again uh, he is already at this point rearmed twice uh, his planes and he decides uh, I'm gonna go with doctrine because Nagumo was strict doctrine officer and he had very strict orders for every single situation given by Yamamoto to all of the officers in this of course this situation wasn't part of them so Nagumo, being a person who couldn't make a choice thinking outside of the box because he was a bit of an older guy, 
he went with the doctrine and he said, I'm going to, you know, get all these plans. They're going to land and then we're going to put out a formation. We're not going to do piecemeal. Of course, uh, irregardless of all this, there was waves upon waves of <laughs> aircraft coming towards him from both Midway yeah. and uh, a few carriers. So it didn't really matter. I mean, you could say it doesn't matter, but in, in terms of efficiency and what he should have done, it matters. Uh, he had the worst case scenario because of all of this. His Zero fighters had been up and about, you know, frantically circling his, <laughs> his ship because they thought they were going to be attacked at any moment. They're running out of fuel. They needed to land. And just like the aircraft coming from Midway, everything needs to land. He can't send more aircraft out. So he had less aircraft than he should have to defend himself. He was attacked oh, like three, four waves. Everything on top of the hangar base was full of bombs being mm -hmm. armed to fight the aircraft, which made it a, a literal powder keg, and his ships were just torn to pieces. A, 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 exactly. And a perfect example of why your cap always has to be available and ready. Yeah. Because without a cap, planes will just fly on through and light you up and it's actually ironic and i say this in uh i think in my wit in my midway episode and my nagumo's dilemma episode that the americans were they just they went with piecemeals a lot because they were just frantically yeah. throwing planes out there and this could be seen i know people can hate me as a little bit unprofessional but it's what won the day <laughs> because because of the japanese doctrine of not doing piecemeals they really yeah. screwed themselves in this circumstance and the americans kind of blunder of it won them today because they had all these planes coming at different times and different amounts and stuff yeah. just hitting from different it was crazy Cause, well yeah because you have to remember human psychology and all that if you have a big wave coming at you terrifying it's the most terrifying thing you could possibly think because you're like we can't stop all these planes some of us are getting hit best chance of success against a, a very large aa gunfire force or any of those caps going around is to send as many planes as possible because yeah. you know a few of them are going to yeah. get through and piecemeals of course they're going to get picked off by zero picked off yeah. but the problem was yes. if you have zero fighters okay yeah they pick off a few of these airplanes okay another one comes and then another exactly. one comes and the zero fighters they need to land to get their fuel and then eventually you're like oh i got a few up there yeah. left and now there's another way if you're yeah. gotten you know that so, and that's what happened that's how the kagar was sunk it yeah. had two zeros in the air was what, it two last i i, I should double check but i remember reading uh, a paper on it that's saying when it was hit the first time four of its zeros had to land to refuel because like you were saying and the other two were it was they were next to do it but they were the only ones there circling so when even a piecemeal came through a diminished cap a, a squad anything. can get through it and don't just remember all the crews on the japanese ships they are constantly being hit like, there is no rest. Yeah. There is no break. You're psychologically, you are on edge hour after hour oh, after hour. And you're just waiting. And you're here again. Dive bombers. And then you're like, you, you go into action. You take care of piecemeal thing. But then you hear tor um, um, uh, Dauntless torpedo bomb. I mean, um, uh, Devastator torpedo bombers are coming in. Then you're training over there. Then you hear again, oh crap, there was more Devastators coming top. Like, every 20, 30 minutes, like... Eventually, mentally, you get worn down and mistakes then start happening. You start seeing holes in the uh, theoretical AA shield, the theoretical cap shield, because just mentally, they're being drained. They're not as sharp as they, they, they would be. So that's how a piecemeal could get through in a, a Japanese mass of many more ships could just get through it and eventually hit every single carrier one after the other. And now we're going to come to our next one, which again is brought to you by Dan Carlin, because this is the place <laughs> I first heard it, and he said it best himself. A victim of its own success is what he called this situation, and this is the interesting downfall of the USS York Yorktown. So during the Battle of Midway, the USS Yorktown had been hit by uh, a... F it was the Hiryu had sent the... Uh, Vals. Uh, yes. I think it was... three A's. If I'm not mistaken, it was... The hero was hit while its planes were out, was it not? Probably it was the when, last one. Yeah, because right? it was hit while the Yorktown was getting hit, if I wasn't mistaken. Yeah, because it was a counterattack against the Yorktown yes. that had just basically demolished all the characters. Yeah, that hit, it was the Kaga and the... Uh, Soryu? Soryu, I think it was. Was it the oh, Soryu? God, people are going to kill me. I'm not a I know, naval historian. I, I, I'm not... An, I know, I, I... At the same time, I'm trying to boost myself up. I specifically studied... Uh, Japanese history 
up to World War II, and then I, World War II is my passion, so I've vigorously been learning as I'm going, and I know from my Battle of Midway, people giving me <laughs> hell of a lot of criticism because yes. I'm dyslexic, and I said B-52s instead of B-25s, <laughs> and I have 300 comments to prove for it. B-52s did not leave the Yorktown. I'll say it again. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, that would have been impressive. <laughs> as I was saying, the Yorktown was hit a few times by some torpedo salvos from some valves, but it wasn't destroyed. I mean, it was lit on fire, some of their boilers were hit, a lot of the planes on their hangars blew up, and there was massive fires everywhere. But much like the incredible repair job that was seen at Pearl Harbor and on the way to the battle, <laughs> the repairmen, um, they did an outstanding job, and they fixed the ship up so much that it looked like it wasn't damaged anymore. So Admiral Fletcher during all of this, he took his command staff and he went on the cruiser Astoria um, safely because they thought, you know, Yorktown was probably going to go down. Uh, it didn't go down and they began towing it and it was, uh, let me get the name of the ship, I wanted the USS Vireo was the one towing it back after it got hit. And now this is where things get really sad. Um, the Japanese had sent a second wave um, to go look, you know, for more targets and they would have overlooked the Yorktown if it had been in a smoke and ruin that it should have been, but the repairman did such a good job, the Japanese pilots thought they had found a brand new carrier because it was so well repaired, and they attacked it again and did such a, an incredibly horrendous amount of damage to it, not knocking it out of the battle, mind you. It was salvageable, apparently. And, uh, yeah, so um, the Yorktown was... Uh, it was a victim of its own repairmen at that point. If they did a shittier job, it actually probably wouldn't have been hit again. Mm -hmm. But that's where we're going to come up to, I think, the most incredible fact that even myself was really unaware of during the Battle of Midway. And uh, it has to do with how Yorktown was technically knocked out. And that is, two vessels from the American side were sunk uh, during the Battle of Midway. And they were both sunk by a submarine. Yeah, the unsung hero um, was one submarine in question, and it was a, it was the I-168, and it was, I want to get the name of the gentleman, the commander of it was Yahachi Tananabe, was going in the submarine, and he was going through what was, seemed to be a bunch of debris from all the battle that was going on. He snuck past a bunch of the American destroyers, mm -hmm. and he found Yorktown. He sent a salvo against it, and it turned out to be the one that actually sunk Yorktown. And in the process, he actually hit the ship that I had mentioned, the USS Vero, that was uh, tugging the... Uh, excuse me, no, it was the USS Hammond. The Hammond was providing auxiliary uh, power with a cable to mm -hmm. Yorktown to keep it alive, because it had just been hit by a second wave by the yeah. Japanese. So uh, the USS Hammond ended up sinking because of the salvo, and the Yorktown, it was proved to be sunk by the submarine, because the Yorktown was tipping at one point. And when they noticed the hull come up, on I think the port side, they they found where the south where the uh, torpedoes hit, and it couldn't have been from aircraft; it had to be from a submarine. So technically, one submarine is what actually destroyed <laughs> two vessels at Midway. The only two vessels that were destroyed at Midway for the Americans, uh, unsung heroes. Because honestly, uh, think about it. Like I I never heard about submarines. Sam, I've, this. this was the first I've ever heard of this submarines at Midway. My always thought was, oh, this was this massive aircraft carrier battle. It's all about the aircraft, yeah. It was, and then you hear, well, the American casualties, well, ship casualties, I should say. I, I do uh, regret saying that. Um, was from a submarine. Like, the, the Americans suffered a lot of losses, like in life and all that, from Japanese aircraft. But oh, the, yeah, yeah, there is a lot of people. That but the ships themselves managed to survive, all of them, up until the submarine apparently came in and snuck through and took two of them out in almost one salvo. That's it's quite impressive of a, especially a Japanese submarine. Oh, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and say this isn't part of the episode, um, but the way that Japanese use submarines compared to the United States of America was completely different during yeah. World War II. It's actually the downfall of Japan. Japan, um, and it's weird to say, uh, sought to be dishonorable to attack convoys and they really thought submarines should only be uh, used offensively in warfare to attack other submarines and ships and for the majority of the war that's all they oh, did yeah. um, while the Americans were using their submarines primarily to attack and transport and convoys hammering and down those convoys like yeah. you can hear the horror stories of the Philippines and all that when they were trying to be resupplied and death just zone. Death. yeah the, well they were I believe 
I don't know if I'm if I'm remembered correctly, they were called the like the death ships, the the merchant fleet of Japan, which no one ever really hear talks about was the merchant fleet, and it was literally they called it being on a casket because most of these merchant fleets were zero protection because the Japanese navy, their philosophy was all naval ships should be offensive, yeah, ships. They were not defensive, and so most convoys that were going to supply the islands or supply the homelands with the resources that they were acquiring Couldn't. were lightly protected, if even protected. So American submarines just had a field day just going to these convoys, sinking these ships. Reinforcements, I, I know this is really going into the future, but at the Battle of Okinawa, <laughs> it, and it, I, this is really, but like... A merchant ship that was carrying 5,000 soldiers, some crack Japanese soldiers from yeah. China, <laughs> yeah. crack soldiers, these were some of the best soldiers, was sunk by an American submarine, all hands lost. Some of the oh. best um, Japanese fighting forces. We could, you could make a whole episode yeah. about how the Japanese Navy and the, and the Army weren't working together. And yeah. the, the loss of, like, all the Japanese were starving and all these islands because they, yeah. no, they had no food. They were foraging half the time. Well, that was, I know we're getting off topic yeah. again, but Japanese philosophy for soldiers were that, whereas the Americans would be supplying their frontline soldiers with all the resources and supplies they need, the Japanese soldier was taught to be self-reliant, as in they needed to find their own food and all that to survive. Which Eating, eating snakes and stuff. Yeah. Which, yeah, and they a lot of these islands, they would say, oh, we could, there's a lot of root vegetables, or there's a lot of turnips, there's a lot of um, all these different types of uh, vegetables that should be, oh, they'll be able to live off them. Well, Not enough. <laughs> the Most Jap of them starved to death. Yeah, because the Japanese yeah. population would exhaust that resource in, in weeks, because, well, it was just full full-hearted thinking by the Japanese to think that yeah. you don't need to supply, you'll keep supply chains operational. Uh, this point I'm about to make is uh, well known to Americans, of course, and I found one thing, and it's a nitpick actually at the Midway movie, and it was, uh, it's not much to say, but it, it is something of importance, and that was the treatment of the POWs mm -hmm. during Midway, because three gentlemen in question were caught by the Japanese, which is highlighted in the movie Midway, might I add, they did a good job of this, except for one key thing that I found. And the three men, uh, let me get their names properly, because everyone knows from my show I mispronounce every name. So we had first Wesley Osmus, who was a pilot of Yorktown, Frank O'Flattery, who was a pilot of Enterprise, and his mate Bruno Peter Guido, who was his uh, radio gunner. So uh, Osmos was held on the Arashi, um, O'Flattery and Guido were held on the cruiser Nagara, and O'Flattery and Guido were interrogated and uh, they were killed while on that ship. Um, what was shown in the movie, if I remember correctly, is uh, an anchor was tied to them and they were thrown overboard. Um, my only nitpick is what is being reported by the Japanese is actually it was a kerosene can that was filled with water tied to their ankles and they were thrown overboard. I can understand film-wise why you would put an anchor because, you know, it's navy and it's symbolic, <laughs> you know, it's a little symbolic, but I'm just saying it was a little nitpicky issue. Uh, but one thing I would like to bring up was that the execution of Osmos was allegedly ordered by Captain Watanabe Yasumuasa whom uh, he later died on a destroyer, the Numakaze, a World of Warships reference there, <laughs> which sank in December 1943. Um, Watanabe would have been put on trial for war crimes because this wasn't the only terrible thing he did, and I mean, that's not saying much for the Japanese because a lot of the officers did a lot of terrible stuff, but it's just a point of reference to make that uh, he did something illegal and he was reported on it. The other two men um, were not reported to be buried at sea, mind you. It was only Osmos who was reported by the Japanese. Um, I believe it was Nagumo himself who made the report. Yeah, yeah, Osmos died on June the 6th and he was buried at sea. The other two gentlemen were not um, talked about, but it is confirmed that they were thrown overboard. Okay, and our last, and I guess the most pivotal, important part of all of this, and it's one that everybody kind of knows, but we can talk a little bit more in depth about it, and that is that the Battle of Midway signaled the arrival of a new era of naval warfare, mm -hmm. dethroning battleships. Mm -hmm. We've already kind of mentioned the three that is being, uh, it's basically, there was the big gun theory, which was that battleships were very important against a newer group of officers who thought that carriers would prove to be the most important thing in warfare. So you can look at it this way. Uh, Nagumo um, was for a long time a big gun theorist, 
and uh, Yamamoto was one of the first people to really see that, you know, aircraft carriers would be the future of naval warfare. And it was at Midway that, you know, it would become like kind of the pivotal... It, it, it's awkward because this is a very awkward... It's a very augur, uh, argued, argued um, part of all this, but basically we had seen instances of carriers being the new best thing already before with the battle of toronto for example that's a great one where mm -hmm. the british knocked out half of the italian naval fleet with biplane swordfish from world war one from world like, war one these were by all sense like all definition a completely obsolete plane that should have been easy but quite this is a funny fact i know just about this was the 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 aa gunners for the Italian Navy, the reason why the swordfish, I think, I don't remember exactly. I know they lost a few planes, but it was like almost nothing they lost. Well, they were surprise attacked. Yeah. It was like, it, yeah. I think, the crack of dawn or something. Anyways, yeah. But when these AA gunmen were shooting, because the Italians did, they did see them, even though it was surprise. They, they had time to get their AA guns firing. We're leading these targets too much. They were, these swordfish were so slow that all the AA ammunition that they were aiming, even though they was ineffective as is, like it made even more ineffective because they're shooting n completely in front of these swordfish planes because they were going so slow. And then they, so when they went in for their dive bomb, oh, not a um, torpedo run, <laughs> they weren't even scared because the bullets weren't even hitting near them because they were so slow. That was just an interesting fact. And uh, actually the Battle of Toronto, I want, I'm, I'm saying Toronto. Trento. 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 Me. There's me Trento. saying Sorry. things improperly, which is like, uh, I guess that's the staple of this channel. Uh, <laughs> it's actually what inspired Yamamoto's plan on <laughs> Pearl Harbor. He had seen the effectiveness of, you know, aircraft against ships. Because this is arguably the first time, I mean, there was testing in, at the Japanese Academy uh, against targets to see the effectiveness of planes against uh, battleships and such. But this was um, a real example of actual ships in warfare being surprise attacked. And this inspired the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, you would think from Pearl Harbor, <laughs> um, the remaining big gun side of the argument, these officers who thought the battleships were still the most important, would realize, well, oh my god, carriers are more important. But take it from even Nagumo himself. When he came back from uh, the Pearl Harbor attack he said you know i got some battleships I, I i took out some of the battleships we did a great job and yamamoto said you didn't get their carriers but the japanese you know paraded this as a yeah. huge success and it was only let's say 50 percent of the officers who realized you know no it's actually aircraft carriers that are the most important they're the most valuable asset in our navy it's no longer these battleships they're actually becoming quite outdated but people and i don't want to throw nagumo under the bus because everyone should that's on Nagumo, <laughs> but Nagumo is like a classic example of like he thought, oh no, you know, you took out the battleships. It's, it's an amazing success, and those are that's what really matters because these are the capital ships. You know, Dan Collins said it best. A lot of people like these officers got attached to their own ships and the name of the ship, and they're like, oh, you know, this is like really important. We can't just throw these things away. Uh, fucking, you know, the battle that Winston Churchill blundered up was all because of that. So. Yeah. Well, this is actually I don't know. I'm asking a uh, question here. Is at the you, you know at the end of the the movie Midway, N Nagumo um, sends in all his battleship forces in a, at night because apparently they were oh, going they to, were sneak to do up a sneak up attack because uh, yeah. attack they were thinking the American task force was going to continually push forward mm -hmm. instead of retreating like it did. Did that actually? Did they still think that the battleships they were sending the battleships in to somehow sneak attack? The carrier task force i think at that point they were just trying to reclaim face because they had just unbelievably lost some of their best assets and uh, despite what people think the battle of midway yeah of course it was a horrendous loss for the japanese they lost a lot of their prime ships but they, they were not taken down they had no. a, their fleet was still powerful they still had a ton more carriers actually the two biggest carriers that they had weren't even present at this battle they had been damaged at coral sea uh, but needless to say, a lot of people argue that uh, the Battle of Coral Sea is when we finally figure out that, yes, aircraft carriers are the most important. Because that technically was like one of the biggest air... It is the biggest, at that point, the biggest aircraft versus aircraft carrier battle. But people still were skeptical. And then after Midway, most of the remaining officers that thought the, the big gun theory was still present, they basically gave that up. And everyone realized by that point that aircraft carriers were the future. And uh, there was less emphasis on uh, battleships. 
which you know it's uh it's sad for us world of warship players <laughs> yeah of course because we want to see those big uh yamato class battleships <laughs> yeah just not to go on a whole world of warships rant but <laughs> please sponsor me <laughs> we love the game and all that playing but yes we we just going off of my studies of the different mu munitions and all that i do have to say wow's puts a lot of emphasis on aa especially the like 40 it's, millimeter Bofors cannons you, and the 20 millimeter Olikin cannons. Yeah, I'm sorry. If you are attacking in like a tier eight or 10 battle with your aircraft going after even like another uh, aircraft carrier, like you can't even put a dent on them. They takes you out like that. It's yeah. ridiculous. And when in reality, well, the 40 millimeter Bofors cannons, they were the best at what they could do. Like during World War II, no one doubted the performance of a Bofors 40 millimeter cannon, but Wow's just exaggerates his effectiveness. Video game, but... Yeah, I know. I, we're ranting. I think we're doing a little game rant now. Same with the 20 millimeter Orlikin cannons, where was, they were small caliber, but they were only effective when you station like 20 of them on a battleship. And even then, you're taking out one plane with those 20 Orlikin Kind of, it's like it. Sorry, that, that I know we went on a little tangent there, but I was just like, it's it's annoying sometimes. <laughs> oh, and I apologize to everyone who's listening to this on Podbean or Spotify as a podcast. I will be editing in and overlaying, yes. you know, some footage to make points and show some of it, especially when Eric was talking about a lot of these specifications with the AA. Yes. Uh, did you actually? Did you get to mention like I, I remember we were talking about this before we did this episode about the molten steel. Yes. Thing. Well, see. <laughs> I remember, funny enough, I, I heard about this information through WoWs too, because they, they, they do have a really nice naval channel where they describe all ammunitions and all that stuff. And they were talking about the Japanese had come up with this ammunition round, which was essentially when fired, it turns into a form of molten metal. I, I might be misinterpreting some of the information. Sorry. <laughs> um, but they were sh the Japanese were relying on this idea that if you make a wall of molten metal as these planes fly in this molten metal will just shear these planes the well the problem was the american pilots knew about this am ammunition type and knew that the only time these things were lethal was if you stayed in the the bubble of where that ammunition was going off where you had the molten metal continuously being put on a plane it, it would eventually damage it but if you just sped up and threw uh, sped through the clouds and all that stuff the molten metal wouldn't have enough time to actually damage your ship and this is what i wanted to bring this up too because I, I know in my past i was trying to tell what the japanese AAA munitions and all that which is what they were called there was also i, I said it was a 20 millimeter cannon they were using i mistake it's a 25 millimeter cannon that the japanese were using for their shorter range but it was just as ineffective because by the time they had the 25 millimeter sighted on a plane the plane was no longer in that spot, so it was it, it was just not to go back into. We already went over that in great detail. Just a little clarification: it's a 25 millimeter. The 20 millimeter was the Orlikin um, American ammunitions. Sometimes it gets confusing when you have like 20 20 millimeter, 25 millimeter, 40 millimeter, five inch shells, six yeah. inch shells. You know, it's a, a lot of people, and I, I hear this in other channels too. You know, they, they give criticism to particularly us YouTubers when we're talking about specific issues. You got to remember, there's like specification when it comes to yeah. history. There's military historians. There's specifically naval history yeah. historians for just these military and numbers. And remember, things were constantly being innovated in the military. Like, just I, I can tell you the Orlikin cannon. If you look at the different um, versions that came out from once it was produced, it's like almost every year it was like you have the Orlikin A, B. Like it just every single type of ammunition on it was constantly being modified with new names, new designations and all that stuff. So sometimes, yes, we say just a general statement because it's kind of hard to be like, oh, it's this exact model that was being used. I got, I had one guy comment, because if you watch my channel, you know that I've been doing a lot of Chinese history in the 19th century, and I got one guy who commented about the specification of a musket rifle I was talking about, because the Chinese had something that was literally labeled, it was a Jimmy rigged uh, rifle they made up when they had taken away from some British uh, some of their muskets, and it was called a musket rifle, I can't remember the technical term for it, and a guy was giving me so much 
flack for it because I couldn't differentiate what kind of uh, rifle it was. But in, in so fact, we, like, there's very little information in English, mind you, on this. And it's like, <laughs> there's only so much I can specifically go into because if I'm making a YouTube video, and let's say, I, even this is super long, this would be an hour long yeah. video. Some of my videos are like 20 minutes long. Even in that, I can barely talk about most of the stuff I want to say. My yeah. scripts are usually 30 mm -hmm. pages, and I use 10 pages of it because I have to condense it. There's a lot I mm -hmm. can't say. That's a, I think that's a common problem with most historians is like yeah. you can never you can almost never know enough because like when you specialize in something if you want to know everything you have to be so specialized in that topic oh God, that yeah. you become not I, I don't want to say oblivious because most historians have a general knowledge of things but you start forgetting other information surrounding it because you're so specific to that one topic to understand all the different aspects the different ammunitions different armaments different the pilot skills the training that would be involved in these things the the maneuvers that these ships have to go the, the supply chain you know well I, uh, I think i had one history teacher that summed it up very well when you're looking at the history behind like a, a certain battle um let's say as a historian, you could be a military historian, and you know, okay, this is a black gun gunpowder age battle. These are the, the muskets that were used. These are the units. These are who trained and this and that. But you don't know what kind of food they're eating. You don't know what yeah. the situation economically was of the country. You don't know, like, there's, like, small yeah. X, Z variables that, you know, maybe other historians who specialize in a different background yeah. that touches that period know, but you don't know. And it's all of us come together eventually to form the real yeah. big picture. But yeah, it's like uh, we all have to specialize somewhere, and I certainly don't specialize in naval warfare. Although, obviously, for this channel, once we get up to the point of naval warfare, like with the Sino-Japanese War, I'm going to do my best to read every book and I've read, like, 30 thus far, to get past <laughs> what I've already made for my uh, YouTube channel, despite what people think and my inability at speaking either Mandarin or Japanese, although I am learning Japanese as we speak. Uh, to say Japanese people to my pronunciation of names and uh, yeah this has gone off the rocker um, yeah yeah we I, I think uh, it's a good place to probably end this after we I think we just did a good 10 minute rant on world of warships and then history yeah. and, and then... I'm gonna say right now I'm gonna totally clickbait the hell out of this video on YouTube and for the rest of you listening to this as an audio it'll just be like any other podcast so yeah. it's gonna work out in the end and I'm sorry if people were disappointed that it's not a 10 minute list video yeah. where someone with a nice narration voice just says and number 10 this point and then they summarize it in three senses and move on and i wanted to go into specifics because we're actual historians and we actually want to talk about things and uh, i know that there's a hardcore group out there who probably listen to dan carlin that uh like that, that and yeah and for the people who know more than us shit could, on us <laughs> please <laughs> yeah because one thing i've always learned i won't learn unless uh, someone at least tells like I will do all my research that I possibly can as a historian But you can never cover anything. So if we say something that you know a little more on co Collaborate with us. Oh, here's a post good it. Tell us yeah. expand like this is a good way. This is co Collaboration Here, here's a good way to end an episode and it touches that point I had no idea that a submarine was responsible for the two yeah. uh, vessels that were hit during this battle. It was somebody who commented on my Battle of the Midway that asked me, Hey, what was uh, the position of submarines during this battle? You didn't mention really anything about submarines, and I happened to be aware that the Yorktown was sunk by one. And when he said that, I said, Really? And I looked it up, I'm like, Oh my god, I was so oblivious to that, and I'm calling myself a historian. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And for all you World of Warship players, carriers are not bad players. We're, we're happy players. I, I play destroyer mostly, and carriers are, are get rid of them. No, 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 I'm not no, gonna no. be see, that guy. I'm not gonna. Be that I'm guy. sorry. You can see the dynamic. He's a DD player. I'm a carrier player. <laughs> hey, double D's all right with me. <laughs> all right, and uh, that's yeah. been the Pacific War Channel. Over and out. Thank you very much, guys, and and ladies. <laughs>